so share screen and uh, yeah we'll just adjust this so we are going to discuss the basics and the key trials so i just uh, briefly wanted to talk to you also about the about the the number of young patients with colorectal cancer that we are seeing uh, in our clinics so uh, i think as oncologists whether you are i've discussed this before whether you are surgical radiation or medical it is our responsibility to try and uh, detect cancer early and also uh, create public uh, awareness so i have this thing for preventing cancer and i i encourage you to use it as well uh, so i won't go in details about it because it is self explanatory but screening s for screening it's a b c d e f uh, for uh, cancer prevention and uh, and if you want we can take a separate class on it uh, based on the evidence that is there for each of these uh, strategies screening uh, the reason i put it here because it's very important for colorectal cancer uh oh sorry i i lost my slides um yeah um so during lockdown i think in covid times uh, we stopped the screening because we wanted to keep healthy people at home and not use the healthcare resources for screening and all the uh, international guidelines and uh, societies and national societies recommended that we stop screening but now that we know that you know this is going to go on for some time i think we have to uh, we have to continue very important that we you prioritize the downstaging of disease now this slide is very important because you know you have healthy abnormal pre invasive it is mainly the cancers with the pre invasive component and those are breast cancer with ductal carcinoma in situ cervical cancer with cervical intra epithelial neoplasia and with colon cancer colorectal cancer so you have the pre invasive stage so that lends itself to screening and also head and neck cancer where you have erythroplakia and leukoplakia so if you uh, diagnose cancers early obviously the cost is less and if you diagnose it late the cost the cost is more colorectal to cancer takes about 10 to 15 years so very important that you know for patients or general general population who are or if you have colorectal cancer patients make sure you take a history for for family history for that patient because you have two pathologies you have familial adenoposis uh, polypi and you also have hereditary non polyp hnpcc which uh, which which you you could uh, send the patient for genetic counseling if uh, if there is family history and also in 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 the family members that come with the patient talk about colorectal cancer screening because as we are becoming more westernized the incidence of colorectal cancer and especially rectal cancer i have seen in young uh, men and women is increasing and it is a very cost effective cheap simple test uh, so in uk if you if you are above 55 um, most uh, most people get a uh, get a get a pot from the gp so very important also to check that how your lab does like if it does by gaiac method you need about six samples based on the evidence if it is by fecal immunochemical method you just need to have one sample and this could be done annually of course the gold standard is colonoscopy and if you do have a strong family history then that patient should undergo genetic counseling and maybe the apc gene or the other gene tests uh, uh, as well so again this is the evidence as to why screening does reduce cause specific mortality in colorectal cancer so that was just uh, about just about 2 minutes on prevention now when you when we come to rectal cancer it's slightly complex uh, what assessment that you need to do for rectal cancer we need to know the depth of invasion uh, i'm going to talk about it uh, are the lymph nodes in is there extra mural vascular invasion and i'll talk about that as well is the crm so you you will hear these words the circumferential resection margin and the mesorectal fascia or the mrf is threatened and one can assess that on the mri scan and also very important for low and mid rectal cancers is it possible to do sphincter preservation and how should the lesion be removed 
Should it be done by a gastroenterologist? Should it be done by a surgeon? And what should be the effect of the surgeon? Should the patient have a temporary stoma or would the patient need, need a permanent stoma? which actually would be uh, life-changing for the patient and would affect quality of life. And the other issues that you have to address uh, in rectal cancer, so there are a lot of issues, that's why we'll do this uh, class in two sessions, is uh, whether you do upfront surgery. Could you mute yourself if you are uh, uh, unmuted? So upfront surgery versus we, how do you select patients for neoadjuvant chemo radiotherapy? And if you want to give neoadjuvant therapy, what should you give? Uh, so now I've put here short course versus long course, but versus there is neoadjuvant chemotherapy or versus total uh, neoadjuvant therapy, which includes everything. So how do you select these patients? Pre versus post-surgery radiotherapy whether you should do immediate surgery post-treatment or whether you should do delayed surgery and what's the time that you need to do a staging assessment. What is the role of consolidation chemo and adjuvant chemotherapy? And if a patient achieves a complete response post all the treatment, what next? I think in breast cancer, we answered that question, that even if you attain a clinical complete response, the patient must undergo breast conserving surgery or mastectomy, whatever, uh, based on the staging. So it is not possible to observe them. In rectal cancer, but you know, in breast cancer, it is possible to do reconstruction and with the oncoplastic measures, uh, there is amazing cosmesis uh, that, is, that is possible. But in rectal cancer, the implications are huge because if it's a low rectal cancer, the patient may be left with a stoma for life and it does affect quality of life. So the implication of complete response is very important to see whether it is possible to avoid surgery at all. And how do you select patients for adjuvant chemo versus chemo uh, radiotherapy? So uh, staging again, um, a reference level and a method in the chat there is uh, yeah okay thank you so uh, you know you have these various terminologies and you get a report from the endoscopist which is different and uh, and the the distance from the anal word is very important so whether it's a low mid or upper rectum tumor so if you do it by MRI, usually we calculate it from the anorectal junction. But if it's a clinical exam or a rigid proctoscopy or flexible endoscopy, you would uh, calculate the distance from the anal verge. So that's why in MRI, up to four centimeter is taken as a low rectal cancer. Four to eight is mid and eight to 12 is a high or upper rectal cancer. And I would say that MRI is, uh, is probably more accurate compared, uh, compared to the other modalities, but we can, uh, we can discuss this. So T staging, again, when you see the report, for a surgeon, it is very important, and also for a gastroenterologist for, uh, for the, uh, where the tumor is, whether it's anterior, posterior, whether it's central, lateral, whether it's pedunculated, annular, semi-annular, whether it's obstructing. Very important that, you know, if it is obstructing, the patient may need a covering stoma to get him through the, uh, through the new adjuvant chemo radiotherapy. So very important that when you see a report or even if uh, assess patient's symptoms, that whether the patient has any signs of obstruction or, or passing stools is very painful if it's a low rectal tumor and, uh, and there is anal spasm, the patient may be in a lot of discomfort and pain. So in that situation, probably if you're planning to give neoadjuvant treatment, um, doing a covering stoma before you start a neoadjuvant treatment would actually be better for the patient. So all of these things that you will be looking at and for T staging, an endorectal ultrasound is very good and also uh, an, an MRI scan as well. So the other thing I think one has to look at is the submucosa. Whether it is visible at the invasive edge, what part of the submuscularis uh, propria is involved. Again, the MRI should be able to, uh, to delineate that. 
So, you know, and also in T3 staging, whether it is T3A, T3B, it's, it's, it's very important for the prognosis uh, of the patient. And, you know, this is, uh, this is one of uh, uh, Professor Gina Brown's slides where she has in the Mercury study correlated each of the MRI findings uh, diligently and meticulously. Uh, she was there at most of the grossing uh, that was done uh, for, for that patient who'd had the MRI. And she has correlated the MRI with the pathology quite accurately. So I think MRI should be the gold standard in uh, rectal cancer patients. So you look at the subclassification of T3, whether there is disruption of the submucosa and what level of the submucosa is preserved because the prognosis is different. So if you have uh, no involvement of the muscularis or, uh, or the microscopic invasion is less than one millimeter, invasion is less than one millimeter like T3A, the prognosis is quite good. So up to one to five millimeter invasion as well is quite good. That would be T3B. So this has not actually found its way in the TNM classification. But if you look at uh, most of the studies which are MRI based that have come out of Gina Brown's group from the Royal Marsden, you can see that it does have a prognostic uh, implication, especially if it is T3C or T3D, uh, which is 6 to 15 millimeter or more than 15 millimeter uh, beyond the muscularis uh, propria. So very important that, you know, when you have an MRI report and if there is any doubt, because it, this actually, uh, all of this helps you in deciding whether your patient can go for upfront surgery or the patient needs a new adjuvant chemoradiotherapy. So if it's a T3C, T3D, you know, that would uh, make you think towards uh, some form of new adjuvant uh, chemotherapy. So these are the relevant features that you would look on MRI pelvis. And if you don't have them, I would uh, like Tata Hospital and the ICMR colorectal guidelines. And, uh, and again, the, uh, the synoptic reporting templates that we have. Uh, we'll talk about these features, CRM, whether the patient has EMVI, the arrow is pointing towards, you know, tumor in the blood vessel, that's extra vasc neural vascular invasion, site of the tumor, anterior, lateral, central, whether the levators are involved or not, uh, and the T and N, N staging uh, as well. So for staging of rectal cancer, my gold standard usually is I do a CT chest abdomen and MRI pelvis because uh, if you do a PET CT scan, uh, then you have to still do an MRI pelvis. So if a PET CT scan has been done, that's fine. Uh, you must also ask for an MRI pelvis uh, unless the PET CT scan you know, shows a large nodes in the pelvis which is not going to change your treatment strategy. And uh, it's clear on the CT component that you, know, you can see that the mesorectal fascia is involved or there are quite big lymph nodes which are going to dictate uh, your new adjuvant strategy. Then you, know, you can reserve the MRI pelvis to when you stage the patient about six to eight weeks after the end of new adjuvant uh, therapy. So um, now that I just wanted to just have two slides on this upper third rectal cancer, you know, there are a lot of papers on it. You can read them as well. Should we treat them as colon cancer or should we treat them as, uh, as rectal cancer? Now it's very clear from quite a few studies that uh, upper third uh, rectal cancer, if it is above the peritoneal reflection, you would treat them as colon cancer and you would consider those patients for upfront surgery and not consider based on the TNM staging, TN staging, you would not consider them for new adjuvant uh, strategy. And again, these are the papers uh, that are the evidence. And uh, I can email you these slides uh, at the end of the lecture and put your uh, number if you want on the, on, the, on the chat group so that I can add you to the WhatsApp group because it's very difficult to email slides individually. So for rectal cancer, you will hear a lot about circumferential resection margin. So no, you know you have the tumor, you may have the blood vessels, uh, and you have the mesorectal fat. So 
again, you know, it, it may be A, B or C. And uh, in, in B and C, the tumor is actually touching the mesorectal uh, circumferential resection margin. And in A as well, it's there in the, in the mesorectal fat. So each of these are actually uh, means that the circumferential resection margin is, is involved. And uh, more than 17 and a half thousand patients uh, with the, the CRM positive, positivity ranging for up to 33%. This has been linked to um, higher uh, local regional relapse, uh, distant metastasis and survival. Mainly the studies, the, the trials have come from the UK uh, MRC, MRC group. So the other question is, you know, what is the distance uh, to CRM that is safe? So uh, whether it's one millimeter or whether it's two millimeter, and you will hear different, different things actually. And uh, again, uh, this is uh, from Gina Brown's group. She has shown that um, that one millimeter on MRI, you can see the curves. The blue is one millimeter, which is doing quite badly uh, as far as local recurrence is concerned. So one and the rest of them are quite on top. So one millimeter on MRI is the only distance that predicts the risk of a local recurrence. And this has been validated by, by Dr. Brown in prospective uh, trials. So again, MRI is very, very important, I think, in the management of a rectal cancer patient uh, to try and do the best for your patient because you want to know what is the risk of CRM positivity and the extent of the extramural tumor so that you can plan your treatment accordingly. Depth of invasion, I think I talked about the submucosal invasion. Why is it important? So if it is superficial one third, the risk of nodal metastasis is 2%. If it is two third, it's 8%. But if the depth of invasion is more than deep, it's one third, the risk of nodal metastasis is more than 20%, up to 23%. So that itself, SM3 is, 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 an, is a very, um, I would say a hard indication for new adjuvant uh, chemotherapy or chemo radiotherapy. So again, these are the various high-risk features uh, which you would look for. And I've put both the trials because slightly different. One says one millimeter, two millimeter. But again, like I said, Gina has shown in prospective studies that you know one millimeter on MRI is highly predictive if it's within one millimeter of uh, local regional local recurrence. And the other high-risk features are low-lying tumors, as we've said, um, or tumor extending more than five millimeter into the perorectal fat or T4N2 disease. Now, is it possible to identify potential uh, CRM positivity? Yes, it is. And, uh, uh, by, uh, uh, and this has been, again, prospectively correlated uh, with, uh, with, with uh, uh, validated as well. So with MRI, you can look at the low rectal cancer surgical plane and see if it is unsafe. It, if it is unsafe, by that I mean that the CRM is, it looks positive. Or if there is invasion of the anterior quadrant of the rectum, less than four centimeter from anal verge or MVI. So uh, if you have none of the above, the chances of pathological CRM positivity is only 1%. We have all of the above, the chances are 60. Mm -hmm. so, and the positive uh, LRT, like I said, you, the chances of uh, R1 resection are about 25%. So again, distance from anal verge and local recurrence rate is very, very important. You know, that if the distance of a high rectal tumor, uh, the radiotherapy patients, but it is not highly sick. Could you please uh, mute yourself, uh, whoever is unmuted? Uh, actually, I have it on that uh, people should mute themselves when they come in. Uh, if somebody can see who it is, if you could tell them, thank you. So uh, what are the indications uh, of new adjuvant uh, therapy? How do you select patients? So, you know, I put up a lot of questions at the beginning and we can discuss. Uh, 
Is there any any question? <laughs> Uh, um, uh, excuse me, ma'am. You can mute uh, the other participants. Host can mute. I have done that actually uh, already. So do I, I have to stop. So uh, there is a remote. Thank you. 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 Thank yeah, so I've done that. Yeah, thank you. So, um, so you're talking about uh, um, indications for a new adjuvant uh, therapy. So we talk about SM3 invasion, which is a hard indication. Extension to pelvic sidewall or pelvic lymph nodes. Again, tumor budding and on biopsy, mucinous subtype is actually a soft indication. N2 disease, that is nodal metastasis in the mesorectum, EMVI, lymphovascular invasion, and especially if it is close to the CRM, is also a very uh, important indication. And I think the other thing is the anteriorly, we talked about anteriorly placed tumor at or below the level. For a surgeon, this is very important in a large male with a narrow pelvis is predictive of a technically challenging discussion and again dissection and it's been shown in quite a few studies with a 30 percent possibility of a crm positivity rate so you must keep track of that and consider the patient for new adjuvant uh, therapy and i've put surgeon's learning curve as well because again that is very important uh, and uh, uh, and uh, and the sphincter preserving surgery very important for quality of life for our patients so this is a slide which I show in every talk for, uh, for any treatment. Toxicity versus efficacy. Uh, as oncologists, this is something that we have to talk and we must talk to every single patient. What is the, even if the patient says to you that, you know, uh, doctor, you decide what is best for me. It is still important that we actually tell them uh, what are the risks and what are the benefits? Uh, what are the toxicity? What is the uh, and what is the you know what is the what is the upside? You may have a patient uh, for like for example, just coming to rectal cancer. Yes, path CR may lead to better outcome and may actually lead to sphincter preserving surgery. But there's only one trial, randomized trial, which has shown that, and we'll talk about that. But the long-term side effects, you know, at, at the Marsden, when I was there, I used to do um, a proctitis clinic with Jarvis Andreev. So patients who'd had short course radiotherapy about five years ago, 10 years ago, would still be coming to the clinic and we'd manage them with steroid enemas and, and quite a few other, other things that, we, that, that I learned uh, in managing proctitis. But uh, at that time, I realized that how important the unintentional release of stools is for patients, how embarrassing it is. And all of these affect quality of life. Yes, you may have cured the patient, but you know, they're still coming to you five years later with these problems. So one has to keep these in mind and talk about it. Sexual function is affected with long course and short course chemo radiotherapy. Anal blood loss is there because of telangiectasias that may happen. Stricture at the anastomotic site femoral head fractures, second cancers, and neuropathy relating to oxaliplatin. So again, you know, very important that, you know, patient is told that this, some of these side effects may be irreversible. So this is just a snapshot view, you know, uh, how we have completely changed uh, rectal cancer treatment. So in 1980s, uh, we knew that adjuvant, uh, we, we would consider most of these patients to decrease the risk of local recurrence for adjuvant chemoradiotherapy. And we knew that it improves outcomes compared to surgery alone. Then this was the NC, NC, NSABP and the NCCTG trial. Then um, we, a decade later, that is in early 90s, when I started training, we had the Dutch TME trial and we had the German uh, trial and the NSABP trial, which showed that, you know, rather than giving uh, chem uh, radiotherapy post-operatively, we should bring it pre-operatively. And I'll talk about that. And then 
we also learned that uh, in 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 the, between 2012 i think uh, we learned that 5fu uh, that capecitabine is non inferior to 5fu because we use fluoropyrimidines in pancreatic cancer in rectal cancer in in gastric cancer we use fluoropyrimidine as a radio sensitizing agent so you know it actually increases the efficacy of radiotherapy and my feeling is that capecitabine and also there is one study which shows that capecitabine very likely is is better than than 5fu and if you are going to discuss uh, chemo radiotherapy capecitabine i feel is better than infusional 5fu and infusional 5fu is better than bolus 5fu so if i had a choice i would actually go for capecitabine and also we learned that you know oxaliplatin has no benefit so we'll talk about these trials as well because i think for your exams and also for uh, when you talk to patients it's important to know the results of these trials and then you know now in this decade we are talking about organ preservation we are talking about neoadjuvant uh, therapy about total neoadjuvant therapy i am going to discuss uh, this decade next week because i want to go through how we have arrived uh, arrived at this uh, in in the last two two decades uh, sorry yeah so pre versus uh, post op uh, radiotherapy this was the german trial which actually uh, a huge number of patients were randomized resectable rectal cancer patients were randomized and uh, by the way if you need any of these trials i will add you to the whatsapp group if you need any of these papers i have all of them uh, i can i can send them to you i think it's easier for me to whatsapp everybody because rather than individually emailing i've realized because i forget so this is a, a, a note that this is a long course chemo radiotherapy and you know when you look at long course uh, you will see that uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, the, there are a lot of uh, dose differences slightly between europe and us so uh, this is a long course 5fu uh, uh, pre operatively followed by a six interval and then radical surgery followed by upfront versus upfront surgery and and most patients uh, uh, got uh, adjuvant uh, therapy so pre versus post op the post op the dose of radiotherapy was slightly on the on the higher side the primary endpoint was overall survival the second trial is very similar uh, which is a short course radiotherapy trial and is known as the dutch tme trial uh, 1800 patients uh, 25 grade uh, radiotherapy given over 5 days one week later patients underwent surgery because at that time the thinking was that you know after short course radiotherapy if you wait for too long the morbidity is higher because fibrosis sets in so it's it's better to uh, operate as soon as possible so versus upfront surgery and the primary endpoint was local control so both of these trials were published in new england journal of medicine and just to show you i just wanted to show you on one slide the german versus the dutch trial and in both the trials you can see that whether it was long course or short course with the use of pre operative radiotherapy there was a significant decrease in local recurrence you know almost half 13% versus 6 6% and 8% versus 2% uh, in 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 the dutch trial and also the german trial is the only trial which has shown a statistically significant increase in sphincter preservation among patients receiving a uh, preoperative uh, chemo radiotherapy but sadly uh, both these studies have published their update you know a few years later in in annals of surgery and journal of clinical oncology and as you can see that none of these trials have led to an overall survival benefit or a disease free uh, survival uh, benefit um, and most of the rectal cancer studies actually have not uh, led to an overall uh, survival benefit but again for quality of life uh, pathological complete response and uh, local recurrence or clinical complete response is a very uh, clinically meaningful endpoint this was the other study done in uk huge number of patients again short course uh, given pre op followed by surgery versus surgery followed by long course uh, chemo radiotherapy 
And as you can see, even though the doses uh, uh, of radiotherapy are slightly different, you can still see that the local regional recurrence was much better with the with preoperative uh, radiotherapy and about 12% patients in this trial who had CRM positivity. And the survival was also, and the disease-free survival and overall survival was, numer was better for preoperative radiotherapy, disease-free survival significantly better. I think the key things to remember is, you know, if we discuss cases or if you bring cases uh, next week, uh, we can discuss you know, why, how you choose short course versus long course and why you should choose one over the other. So compliance, frailty is very important. So I'll just give you an example of two patients I had um, very recently uh, uh, here uh, last year. So both of them were in their 80s. And uh, so one was 88, 85, one was I think 84, very, uh, I would say mid 80s. One of them was playing golf till about a week before and presented with a CRM positive um, uh, T, T, T3 uh, CRM positive N plus uh, MRI staged uh, uh, cancer. The other one also had uh, 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 an indication, a hard indication for neoadjuvant chemo radiotherapy, uh, CRM positive as well. Now on one patient, we decided to go for long course because chronologically, though he was 85, biologically he was in his, he looked as if you know, he was in his 60s. He was a fit gentleman. He was playing golf, was, was not frail. So we went for long course chemo radiotherapy and he attained the clinical complete response and then went on to have a surgery. The second, which showed a path, pathological complete response, the second patient had a short course uh, chemo radiotherapy, and um, we operated. What we did was we, uh, if I do give, uh, uh, so we waited for six to eight weeks. But in that six to eight week interval, I gave him capecitabine in two cycles uh, while we were waiting, and he also had a pathological complete response, which is, uh, I mean, which was which was very lucky to have these two patients who were in their mid eighties do so well um, with these two different strategies. And we will talk about today also whether, you know, I could yes, observe you, Ma'am, uh, ma short course with the uh, chemo, uh, was it with the concurrent chemo or was it after? Uh, uh, no, after. So afterwards. So they had uh, short course chemo. And then about two to three weeks later, I also, because the, uh, normally if patients are above 75, I also do DPD gene mutation testing because um, again, you know, it's, uh, uh, it's uh, because if patients have this positive, then the risk of cardiac toxicity, especially coronary vasospasm or grade four neutropenia, grade four diarrhea is quite high. In fact, when I was in Tata, I uh, published, uh, we published uh, three case reports with grade four toxicity with the fluoropyrimidine with, uh, with Samir Rastogi, who's, uh, who's now at Ames. And uh, so this is something, and, and most of the patients who end up having this grade four toxicity are usually elderly, can happen in a young patient as well. But in elderly, you don't have to improve or get better if you have a grade four neutropenia or if you have grade four diarrhea. So, uh, so I tend to do in most of my patients who are above 75. So the way we give it is I give short course. I'll actually talk about the studies as well, where they've given short course followed by uh, interval chemotherapy. So I think all of these things are the things that you would look at. Cost is a very important factor as well because long course and uh, Working in, you know, whether you're working in Tata Hospital is different or Ames or Adyar or any of the regional cancer centers. But if you uh, are working in a private center, you know, it's, uh, it's a revenue driven model. So it, everything depends on the number and the fractions of radiotherapy as well. So uh, if we go down, so now the question is whether you should go for short course or long course. Uh, that is a very important question. And these are the two uh, trials which looked at in T3 tumors, looked at um, uh, short course versus long course uh, radiotherapy. And as you can see, 
that the local control was not significantly different. In fact, probably short course, it was slightly better. Uh, so if you look the the pink line, the short course, the risk of local regional recurrence is slightly better, but not significantly different. So we should not read too much into it. And similarly, you know, uh, in, in, in the TROG trial, you can see that the local control is pretty similar, five versus seven um, percent, uh, four versus seven uh, percent uh, between short course uh, and uh, long course. The overall survival, you can see the curves are literally on top of, uh, of each other. Sphincter preserving, again, you know, how do you, so if your patient has an APR, or the patient does have a stoma. So if you look at both the trials, the Polish trial and, 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 and the other trial, patients had quite um, uh, 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 higher stage tumors, T3, N2, T3, T4, up to six centimeter. Uh, the other trial had up to 12 centimeter. That's why the rates of APR are slightly different. But you can see the rates of APR in both the studies in the randomized trial are pretty similar. And like I said, oh, they were all low tumors in Polish trial uh, uh, compared to the other one. Now the next question we have, is it safe to delay surgery? Because you know our thinking was we should operate within a week after short course radiotherapy, otherwise the fibrosis will set in and it will be quite difficult for the, our surgical colleagues to operate. So this was answered by this Stockholm trial and uh, patients were randomized to short course followed by surgery versus short course, they had an interval with, followed by delayed surgery versus long course followed by delayed surgery, which was usually uh, four to seven weeks uh, um, and as you can see, and you can look at the distant metastasis, there is absolutely no difference in all of the three arms uh, with the delay in, uh, in, in doing, the, doing the surgery. So then the next question is, you know, you have this gap uh, of four to six weeks after short course. Uh, can you intensify, or even after long course, can you intensify the chemotherapy uh, given uh, with the so no, we'll come to the question next. Uh, the, the other question is, can you intensify chemotherapy given with radiotherapy? So, you know, obviously as oncologists, when we learned that capecitabine is very good with radiotherapy, we want to add the second most effective drug, which is oxaliplatin. And there were four trials which did that, the STAR, Prodige, and all of these trials which are listed here. So they looked, they added capecitabine, they added oxaliplatin to either capecitabine or a 5-FU. And as you can see, uh, that addition of oxaliplatin did not improve outcomes. So the PAT CR rate, as you can see, has, has not been significantly different. It has been, um, just if you look at the German trial, it was 13 versus 17%. Uh, uh, but other than that, there was, and this is the trial where you had most of the patients were able to have a sphincter preserving, preserving surgery um, in, um, with, with, the, with the new adjuvant uh, chemo radiotherapy. But uh, there was one trial, which is the Avacross trial, I haven't put it here, uh, which actually added bevacizumab as well, preoperatively to new adjuvant uh, chemotherapy, and the path CR rate was 36%. But the surgical morbidity was so high that that has never taken on as a regimen uh, for preoperative treatment. And actually, either uh, infusional 5-FU or capecitabine remains the standard of care, and this has not been practice uh, changing. So when should you scan after chemoradiotherapy? So if you look at this, uh, this, uh, the, these pictures, uh, these, I've borrowed them from Professor Gina Brown. So this is baseline MR uh, T4 a T4 tumor uh, going into the into the into the mesorectal fat. After six weeks, the this has gone down and it's become T3B, and uh, after 12 weeks, it's become T2. And then she has correlated with final pathology, and it was YPT2 N0. So uh, when should you do the scan actually? So there are quite a few trials which have looked into the timing. And, uh, and this was the randomized trial, the, the Greek R6 trial, which, which looked at seven weeks versus 11 weeks interval 
post completion of neoadjuvant chemo radiotherapy or what is the effect on uh, complete pathological response rate i think i'm going to stop in 4 minutes and we'll discuss the the some questions and then maybe take it on next week and as you can see in this trial there was no difference in pathological complete response rates in fact 11 week group had uh, slightly more medical complications and worse rate of complete tmes we'll talk about what is a complete tme and you know how a pathologist can actually tell if the surgeon has done a good quality tme very important that you have a good pathologist who takes photographs of the specimen that have come out so that you know you know as a surgeon what is the quality of your tme and how you're going to improve at tmh also we looked at this and i think uh, uh, it has a, a bigger uh, study has been published after this and we also saw that you know the pathological complete response whether it was less than 8 weeks or more than 8 weeks uh, more than 8 weeks it was numerically higher 23% but there was was not statistically different now if you look at tumor response you know the timing trial so these are the four cohorts where you know patients had a uh, uh, short course uh, sorry had long course chemo radiotherapy so in the first cohort interval to surgery was 8 weeks then they added in two cycles of full fox four cycles six cycles of full fox and as you can see that the further you have got gotten from the completion of chemo radiotherapy 8 weeks 11 15 and 19 weeks the rate of pathological complete cr has actually increased so the radio the thinking behind it is that the, that the radiotherapy keeps working at downstaging the tumor even after uh, even after you know 10 weeks or 12 weeks so 18% versus 38% and i think these results of 38% we've only seen uh, in chemo with avacross study um So I think uh, why are we trying to attain a path CR or complete CR? So you know it's uh, in India. I don't if if you practice here, we all do, and the, most of our patients actually decline having a stoma. And a lot of times I've seen actually that patients are lost to follow up. They do not. Uh, they do not once they have had a good response. Once their anal spasm or the sphincter sym symptoms or bleeding has stopped, some of the patients actually disappear. so very very important you know when you go out in the community as oncologists counseling is very important that you know uh, that even if they are very anti stoma and they want to discuss watch and wait this is something you must bring into the conversation early on so that you know the patient does not disappear and then comes back with a with with, with a horrible recurrence um, uh, a year later or two years later so um sorry four strategies to attain cr you can intensify new adjuvant we've discussed that adding oxaliplatin makes no difference extend the interval we've discussed that with the timing trial you can add chemotherapy during interval after ctrt we've discussed that uh, uh, as well and you can also give induction chemotherapy followed by chemo radiotherapy we will discuss that with the trials that are presented at there were actually three practice changing trials presented at asco this year uh, rapido opera and and the prodige uh, study so this we've discussed addition of saliplatin makes no difference so the first trial actually for your exams you must know the leon study you know uh the interval the timing we talked about the time the grecar study 7 versus 11 weeks which is the true randomized trial but the leon study was the first one which showed doubling of path cr rate when you increase the interval from 2 to 6 to 8 weeks and again all of these studies you must know at least some of the basics about these uh, trials and the third strategy was the timing trial and uh, and again you can give new adjuvant chemo followed by chemo radiotherapy we'll discuss that next time so just in two three slides i'll i'll finish this non operative therapy can you avoid surgery for some patients who attain a complete clinical response yes you can actually let us stop now it is uh, uh, 6:46 um So I'm going to now go through the questions that you have, uh, and uh, you can wave your hand as well if you. So I have got your phone numbers. I will add you to the group. Uh, great. Um, 
let me just go up uh, so I'm not able to. So why don't you actually unmute yourself and ask a question if you have, or if you have a case that you have seen uh, that has been quite difficult uh, that, or any questions you have about what we have presented today. Um, can I ask one question? Sure, sure. Please go ahead, Kanchan. Uh, uh, you said uh, for pelvic lymph nodes, we give uh, chemo radiotherapy. Uh, yes. Why don't we operate these patients? I mean, why only radiation? No, they, these patients do get operated. So they... they I, mean, this is I meant uh, pelvic lymph node dissection, why it is not done? So when, uh, when the surgery is done, if the, if, if the surgeons feel that the lymph node was involved, they would remove it if it was positive. But it would, uh, the, the, so these patients, we would consider them for long course chemo radiotherapy. And so does that mean that even after neoadjuvant chemo radiation, we have to do that pelvic lymph node dissection if there is uh, on a post uh, neoadjuvant chemo RT MRI, there is uh, the nodes have uh, completely resolved and uh, there are no new nodes seen. Still, we have to do the pelvic lymph node dissection. Ideally, it should be done actually. Ideally. Uh, because uh, there is no evidence that you know that you don't operate, but you know if you if you have done a good quality MRI, this is what we used to do earlier with the uh, with the concept of watch and wait and us all of us being comfortable with watch and wait. Like if you asked me this question four years ago, I would say you should operate. But now with the watch and wait strategy, and we have quite a few patients, and we'll talk about it. If they are on close follow-up with MRI scans uh, and the trigger trial, hopefully will answer this question as well uh, about patients who have nodal involvement. Obviously, the risk of recurrence is going to be very high in these patients because uh, it's a higher stage tumor. But then with the watch and wait strategy uh, that is coming in, uh, if you, on MRI, you've had a complete response, TRG 1 to 2, YMR then you know there is a rationale to consider watch and wait for these patients as well. 65 year old female anal verge growth growing uh, six centimeter to reach low rectum with inguinal nodes enlarged. Biopsy adenocarcinoma. Now you know if uh, for the again the the, the nodal the regional supply for anus is, will go into the inguinal lymph node so that becomes local regional for anus. But for rectum, the inguinal nodes are metastatic. So, uh, and now the question is very, very important. And this is something which we face in the clinic all the time. The question is, how do you treat the patient? Do you treat the patient with radical intent and um, uh, curative intent? Now this patient has M1 disease. Um, and, uh, but also one could argue that, you know, the patient has oligometastatic disease because it is less than three sites which are involved. So uh, I would say that uh, uh, I would treat this patient with curative intent if it is just one side, but we should also go for inguinal lymph, lymph node dissection if your, if your patient is going to undergo surgery and treat them with the, uh, as oligometastatic disease. So then to consider single agent CAP or Zelox, 74 year old male. Okay, so now from the colon cancer trials, uh, you know, the mosaic, the mosaic trials, we've learned that in patients above 70, single agent capecitabine uh, is as good as uh, capecitabine oxaliplatin and adding a doublet actually makes no difference. So uh, if you're talking of neoadjuvant, I would not add oxaliplatin anyway with radiotherapy, even if they are 50 years old of age. But if you are talking of neoadjuvant chemo alone, you can give capecitabine oxaliplatin if the patient is fit, has a normal end of organ function. In adjuvant setting, I would consider CAPE alone because, you know, again, I will discuss next week for rectal cancer, we have extrapolated most of the data from colon cancer. And in colon cancer, we know that patients above 70 adding oxaliplatin post-op actually uh, makes no difference at all. 
but new adjuvant you know our aim is to try and see if we can six centimeter you know you can uh, actually uh, avoid a stoma um, so i would probably give uh, capecitabine oxaliplatin followed by radiotherapy or give just long course chemo radiotherapy followed by surgery then uh, ma'am short course versus long course short have more acute toxicity so is it better to go for long course uh, i i mean i am not a radiation oncologist uh, but i most of my experience has been that you know both of these have their own downsides and upsides and uh, uh, and long term toxicities are the one which are which are quite uh, quite uh, we don't know much about for short course but otherwise from all the data we have i think uh, most of it is quite uh, it's very well tolerable and most of the patients after short course when we have given them um, chemotherapy they have tolerated it well as well so in in an elderly gentleman i might just give capecitabine alone like i did with this patient who was 84 years of age but but if it was a young patient i would give them uh, capox uh, in the interval like in the trial you saw that you know the patients got folfox so uh what is the experience on observation only post ctrt i think i'll discuss that next week uh, mainly it's the brazilian uh, angelita haber gamma data so uh, yeah. huh. any set of patient uh, who can be taken up for short course rt with immediate surgery and then adjuvant chemo yeah you can you can there's nothing against it uh, that you know you can take them up for uh, short course and followed by immediate surgery but then you know you know that uh, the chances of pathological complete response are going to be higher if you do delayed surgery so i think most of us uh, who are treating rectal cancer are now uh, delaying the surgery and in between even if you don't give chemotherapy just delay it anyway because you know if by delaying it the chances of uh, your patient undergoing a higher response rate are higher then if sphincter is compromised is it rational to go for short course radiotherapy in these patients now this is a very important question you know and we see this so often in our clinic so patient comes with you know they can't even sit they come with a tire or a tube in the clinic because just even sitting down is so uncomfortable and so painful and when you examine the tumor is coming out the sphincter is involved they have fecal incontinence now uh, so this is again you know this is a, a personal experience and uh, this is what most of us do uh, nowadays is i would actually prefer to give this patient something like folfox or folfirinox as well because uh, if it's a young fit patient because you know within 3 4 days the symptoms get better or within a week i would say the patient gets some relief now in this patient if you give radiotherapy first of all it's going to irritate more and the symptoms actually get worse before they get better and uh, in majority of patients i have seen that you know we have been if you going to give radiotherapy to this patient and not give chemo because you know the patient has uh, multiple end organ dysfunctions then uh, i would advise you to do a covering stoma because you know it will be impossible to hold the patient's hand otherwise uh, throughout the radiotherapy but uh, i would uh, if it's a young fit patient i would give folfoxiri or folfirinox and most of the patients actually switch off their disease and they have uh, quite prompt symptom relief and then you know i would give them uh, chemotherapy for 3 4 cycles and then go for short course or long course whichever you want to go for so why chemo not given with short course again you know short course is quite toxic it's 25 5 gray per fraction uh, so uh, it's a very high dose so uh, that's why i think it's not given and with long course i think the dose is 2 gray or 1.5 1.8 gray uh, so the dose is less and the rationale is you know it's it's used as a radio sensitizer so uh, so the modulation is better and uh, in 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 increasing the effect of radiotherapy so uh, then is there any indication for prophylactic colostomy yeah this is the indication i said you know if the sphincter is involved the patient is very uncomfortable then uh, we would do this prophylactic uh, stoma uh, 
uh, either an ileostomy or a colostomy, whatever the surgeon uh, prefers based on the definitive surgery that is planned. So you would do a prophylactic uh, stoma. I always say a stoma because uh, I let the surgeon decide whether they want to do an ileostomy or they want to do a colostomy. Most of the time they do a, an ileostomy actually uh, so that you know the, the surgical planes are not uh, disturbed. Yes, you can get the PPT. I'm going to add all of you to this group and uh, I will uh, put the P PPT as a PDF in the group so that you can, you can read the papers. If you need any of the papers, just ask me on the group and I will uh, send it to you. Yeah. And, uh, any, uh, so if patient develops sphincter compromise during NACTRT, should we manage further? So, you know, it's uh, again, this is uh, during the NACTRT, usually they will not develop. Usually it's, uh, 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 I think there are various strategies one can, uh, one can employ to, uh, uh, so, you know, it depends what the sphincter compromises. If it's just an anal spasm, you can give some antispasmodics, which might help. But if it's tumor related, uh, it's not going to get better unless, you know, the treatment starts working and then you need a prophylactic uh, stoma. And for the wait and watch uh, approach, which one is better, like short course followed by chemo or uh, CTRT, after CTRT also concurrent uh, chemo uh, will be given for a longer period? So, you know, you can only watch and wait those patients who have a higher clinical complete response rate. So whichever strategy leads to the highest clinical complete response rates is better. So I'm just treating a patient on the trigger trial, actually. She's come from London. She's had her radiotherapy. And now I've given her six months of uh, Folfox after she has completed long course. She's 75. So she has completed long course chemo radiotherapy as part of the trigger study. And, uh, and now has attained on MRI. Her TRG is one to two. And uh, just last month, she has finished six months of full fox. And now she will be just observed. So we don't know the results of the trial yet, that whether this is the right way forward. And I would not recommend that we do that. But, uh, but again, whatever, whichever strategy gets you the highest path CR rate. And you know, these are the four strategies we've discussed. Uh, which can lead to the highest path response rate. And the thing that's most attractive is, you know, the longer interval and, uh, and uh, filling the gap with the uh, chemotherapy. And again, you know, we know that uh, a lot of times I'm asked, why don't you give uh, RAS wild type? Why should we not give adcetuximab or give, you know, full uh, irinotecan? Unless you're giving folfirinox or folfoxiri, Folfiri has no role in early colon cancer because all the trials with irinotecan were negative. All the trials with bevacizumab and cetuximab in early colon cancer were negative. So that is the reason why we don't add irinotecan or folfiri or uh, cetuximab or bevacizumab. Uh, so then how many weeks can we delay surgery post new adjuvant therapy for better path CR? So, you know, like I said, uh, uh, if your patient is counseled uh, well and uh, so the time that we delay is about, uh, we do an, I do a, tend to do an MRI at seven to eight weeks. So let's say a patient has had long course, I would do an MRI at seven to eight weeks. We will do the MRI uh, 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 tumor regression grade. And if it is one to two, one can start thinking about what watch and wait, but that is not the standard of care currently. One must, rem one must remember that, one must explain to the patient and you know, only do it with patients who are you know, completely declining a stoma. But otherwise, uh, uh, and then these patients should be taken up for surgery after I would say six to eight weeks. So uh, I would not delay any further uh, because as you saw in the 11 week trial, uh, there was increased morbidity and surgical uh, complications of patients who were waited till 11 weeks. And that is the only very well done randomized clinical trial that we have uh, with uh, about the duration of uh, treatment. So wait and watch approach, is it at present standard of care? No, it is not standard of care. I think we have to individualize uh, in every patient. 
and uh, so uh, and we'll talk more about it how you select patients for watch and wait and how you follow them up i think that is very very important okay i think we're going to stop now next week i'm going to add all of you i'm going to stay on this uh, for a bit more and then i will add you to this group and uh, and plus you can ask anything on that group and also tell me what after rectal cancer what you would like me to cover so we'll finish rectal cancer next week so we finish neuroendocrine now we'll finish rectal cancer and uh, next uh, you tell me which topic um, uh, in gi cancer so we'll try and finish gi cancers first whether you want to do gastric or you want to do hepatocellular or you want to do uh, any other cancers uh, let me know okay brilliant ma'am excuse me ha bolo yeah tell me T TRG score you told how how do we do the scoring? So your radiologist has to do it on MRI. So you know if you uh, wherever you are, like I am here at Max, so our radiologist has a synoptic reporting template. If you look at the ICMR guidelines, uh, Indian Council of Medical Research guidelines, uh, I chair that committee for colorectal, and we have put the synoptic report reporting template in that document. for pathology reporting also and for uh, and for mri also so and that mri if you've done it after new adjuvant therapy should give you the trg and you know dr gina brown does a course uh, i think twice a year and it's online as well available now how you and plus dr suprita arya is there in in bombay so a very important you know that you find the right radiologist to uh, make sure that you get the trg if you really want to consider uh, watch and wait uh, in your patient slightly i would say um, with little bit of confidence it's not standard of care still so don't get me wrong uh, so but if i if a patient has an mr like mr like this patient had you know and when you see the path cr on pathology it kind of also uh increases the belief in your radiologist as well so i think again this is a learning curve for all of us including the radiologist as well okay so i'm going to now sit okay, and add you, okay take care i will see you next week yes ma'am thank you ma'am okay bye 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 oh gunjan has been great she's added lot of people <laughs> thank you gunjan thank you so much